So great to see you this morning at Pleasant Valley Church. If you're joining us online, we also are so grateful for your presence among us. And if you are a guest with us in the house, so glad that you are with us today. What a glorious week God has given us. And and this much I know about life. For some of us, you could probably say, my week was awesome. For others, you may very gleefully say, it was an awful week. And all of us are somewhere in between awful and awesome. But friends, what we need more than anything else today is to turn our eyes to the God of the Scripture, to worship Him, to encourage each other, to strengthen one another by giving ourselves to the Word of God. And if we have had not had the pleasure of meeting yet, my name is Jordan Johnson. I have the joyous privilege of serving as senior pastor in the life of this church. Stand with me if you would. We're going to read a passage of Scripture together on the screen. I put it on there, and uh, we're going to read it out loud. And friends, we call this our call to worship, because friends, worship is seeing God for who He is and responding accordingly. Let me say that again. Worship is seeing God for who He is and responding accordingly. So in the Bible, we see God crystal clear. So let's read this passage together, that I'm going to say a word of prayer, and then our wonderful worship team are going to lead us in song. Let's read this together. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments, and how inscrutable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been His counselor? Or who has given a gift to Him that He might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. And Lord, we do bless your name today for this time of corporate worship. God, as I said in the opening, there are some in this room and some watching online who have had an awesome week, a week where they've seen your hand in in various ways, and they're very aware of your presence and your power and your provision and your person, and they come here today with a celebrative heart, just overflowing with gratitude and joy toward you. And Lord, then there's others who have tasted your bitter providence in their life this week. Things have not gone as though they would want them to go. Their emotions are unstable, and they're just having a difficult time this morning trying to wrestle with the various plates that are spinning in their life. And God, what we need more than anything is to see you, to see the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge that are you So as we lift our eyes to you, God, I pray that you would inhabit the praise of your people, that we would be a church that sings to you. There are some in this room who are in that awful weak status, and they need to hear the people of God singing to you. So we pray as we worship you in song, as we hear your word, as we hear announcements, as we give financially, and everything in between, may we truly worship you and do everything that we do as an act of glory unto your beautiful name. Oh, the depths of your wisdom. I pray that to you, for you, and through you, you would be glorified in our midst. We love you, Jesus. Be big among us. And the people of God said, Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down 
of your life that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory. Who rules the nations with truth and justice? Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is a failing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is a failing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus my savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me and i knew him and all my love is to him he plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again, and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. 
And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Good morning. You can have a seat. Good morning and welcome to Pleasant Valley Church. It's good to see you all this morning and uh, good singing. It's good to hear everybody uh, joining in and singing as well. My name is Doug Griggs. I'm one of the elders here and I uh, just want to welcome you and especially if you're here for the first time. We have connection cards uh, in the uh, back of the pew in front of you. You'll see some cards there as well as envelopes and those cards are a way for you to give us some information. We'd love to to get to know you. If you're here for the first time, we thank you for being here. It's always good to see new faces. And so if you would take that card, uh, take a look at it, you could fill out some information there. We would love to get to know more about you, reach out to you, and let you know how much we appreciate you being here. And also there's an opportunity, it says there, you can check more information about PVC. We'd love to be able to answer your questions about PVC. And so um, if you would do that, drop it in one of those envelopes, uh, offering plates as you leave. We would appreciate that. This card can also be for those of you that are members as well, though, right? If you have a prayer request or it says info on my next steps, maybe you're interested in getting involved in ministry and you'd like to kind of let us know and talk about that, um, opportunity to indicate that on here as well. So um, please take advantage of that. We'd love to hear from you this morning. We have a few announcements uh, to make. Uh, first off, Midweek Bible study. So as most of you know, we have a midweek Bible study, 10 o'clock, Wednesday mornings. And uh, Larry Massey leads that study. Uh, Larry does a great job, loves God's word, teaches it well. So it's an opportunity for you to come out. It's, it's mostly uh, senior adults, but everybody is welcome. And so 10 o'clock, Wednesday mornings, and they're starting back up this Wednesday. Uh, they took the month of July off, but they're starting back up this Wednesday. So make sure you kind of mark that on your calendar and be out here for that study. Uh, next thing, Wednesday night prayer. Uh, so this coming Wednesday is first Wednesday prayer and praise. So typically we uh, take your prayer requests and praises. We pray about those things. Um, if you've been uh, watching the prayer chain this week, we have a lot of our folks that uh, need our prayers, right? And so please come and join us Wednesday night, seven o'clock. Uh, for praises, prayers, and we'll also pray about other important things that are going on in the life of our church. But we would love to have you out here. And I'll just tell you this, the last few weeks, um, we've had people coming that have children, and we've been uh, having uh, someone kind of take care of the children, a little lesson. Um, if you're here and, and you want to come to Wednesday Night Prayer and you have children, come out, and we will have something for your kids. Uh, so we'd love to see you Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. Um, Sunday morning, August 7th, promotion Sunday. So uh, hard to believe, but school is about to start again, right? Here we are. Tomorrow is August. And so uh, next Sunday, we will promote children. Go to your normal class. And then for those that are kind of making a new 
milestone, getting into a new class, we will take you at some point during the class to your new place. Uh, that'll be next Sunday, August 7th. And then we have a couple fellowships. It's always great to talk about fellowships, right? So, uh, we want to, uh, once again, just continue to welcome the Johnsons. Uh, and so we're going to have a little, we're calling it a Johnson Family Fellowship. It's a good time to come out. Uh, more details to come, but it will just be a time of fellowshipping together, getting to know the Johnsons, and getting to know each other as well. So more details will come out about that. Men's breakfast. Men's breakfast. There's a men's breakfast coming up uh, this Saturday. Uh, Jason uh, always has a great lesson, and the food is always really good. So uh, come on out, 8 o'clock. He's very good, about one hour. So you come out at 8, uh, you'll be going home at 9-ish. Uh, and so uh, uh, men's breakfast, and then we have this back-to-school bash as well. More details will follow on these things. But these are great opportunities for the body to just come together and get to know each other better, fellowship. I always love to uh, see the energy around those things. So mark those on your calendar. We'll have more details in the weeks to come. So speaking of more details, Jen Caldwell does such a great job of leading the Operation Christmas Child Ministry, and Jen's been giving us updates through the year. So Jen has a little update. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so shoebox season is quickly approaching. We've been going strong all year, and we have one more collection um, to follow up. This one will be for the older girls, and it's the easiest one so far. We're going to be collecting sewing kits and fabric squares. Um, I'll have some examples out front. You can come and check them out and where you can find these things. Our goal is to collect 30 sewing kits, and then we'll divide up the fabric amongst them so that all the girls can have something to do with their sewing kits. And then next, you'll want to save the date for our prepping party. On September 24th, we'll get together downstairs and put together the fishing kits, the maracas, and the sewing kits that we've been collecting. We'll have some good food, and there'll be some raffle items that you could win for your shoebox. And more information on that as we get closer. And I don't have a fun closing, so I'll just say happy shopping. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Jen. You know, uh, there are a number of ministries that we get involved in here at Pleasant Valley Church. This is one that we've been involved in for years. I would say over 20 years. And, uh, you know, last year we had the privilege when we took the boxes over to the collection center to talk to a gentleman who is uh, part of that organization. And he told us, I believe the number was over 11 million children have accepted Christ over the years that Operation Christmas Child has been um, ministering. Uh, so, you know, this is important, important stuff we're talking about. It's an opportunity to, uh, yes, uh, send a, a shoebox with gifts that maybe a child wouldn't otherwise get, but it's a starting point for them uh, getting into a discipleship class where the gospel is presented and, and many, many children have come to faith. So uh, it's a good, good opportunity to be involved in something that's really bigger than just Northeast Ohio. So uh, let's go ahead, let's have a prayer and then we will uh, get back to uh, some more worship. Let's pray together. Father, uh, thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us, uh, just for the, the beautiful weather, the sunshine. We are reminded of you when we see it. Uh, Father, thank you for the amazing grace that we sung about this morning, that you are the God who uh, uh, reached out to us even in, while we were yet sinners. The Bible says Christ died for us. We thank you for that you are a gracious God. And Father, we thank you for the love that we studied about in our, in our Bible study hour today, the love that you have showered on us. Uh, Father, we are so thankful that you are the God of love. Father, we thank you for this great opportunity to be in your house and, Father, to worship you, to sing these praises. You are worthy of every praise we could give you. So, Father, we pray uh, that we would worship you with a heart of, of love and a heart of gratitude for what you have done for us, how you've changed our lives. Uh, Father, we, we thank you for Jordan, and we, we pray that as he brings our message today, as we continue to talk about the gospel and what is the gospel, Father, I pray that our hearts would be ready to receive it. Father, that uh, maybe there are some here today that have never heard the good news that Jesus uh, gave his life 
for us. And that he, the Bible says, even though we were sinners, there is still an opportunity for us to spend eternity in heaven. Father, I pray that uh, if there are some that have never heard that message, that today, uh, as they hear it, um, curiosity would kind of creep into their hearts. And Father, that um, we would have the opportunity to share the good news of Jesus. And Father, maybe there are others who are just in various stages as they heard, but maybe they never believed. Father, we pray that today would be the salva day of salvation for many. Each one of us, as we hear the word, uh, would be stirred to action. We would be stirred to um, what your will is for us. Father, we thank you once again for all of these blessings. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand as we continue to worship our Savior who brings us hope. What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone, Christ alone. What is our only confidence? That our souls to Him belong. Who holds our days within His hand? Who comes apart from His command? And what will keep us to the end? The love of Christ in which we stand. Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and death. What truth can calm the troubled soul? God is good, God is good. There is His grace and goodness known. In our great Redeemer's blood, who holds our faith when fears arise, who stands above the stormy child. Who sends the ways that bring us nigh unto the shore, the rock of Christ? Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we Christ, our hope in life and death. Unto the grave, what will we sing? Christ, he lives, Christ, he lives. And what reward will heaven bring? Everlasting life with him. Then we will rise to meet the Lord, and sin and death will be destroyed. And we will face an endless joy, when Christ is ours forevermore. Oh, sing. our hope in life and death. Oh, sing hallelujah. Our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah. Now and ever we confess. Christ, our hope in life and death. Now and ever we confess. Christ, our hope in life and death. Amen. Please.
please remain standing as we read from God's word. First Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 8. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And then he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for your word. We are thankful for this time that we can come together and worship you and praise you for who you are. Lord, we do not take that for granted, that we can come freely to this place, Lord, and worship you. Father, we pray now as we go into a time of hearing your word, we pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to us and reveal the truth of your word today. Lord, open our hearts and our minds to everything you would have us to learn. We love you. pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. You may be seated. He was only 27 years old, and by many respects, he was way ahead of his peers. When it came to academics, when it came to theology, when it came to his vocation, when it came to any legality, it was very difficult to find a man who could surpass his competency. He was very clear in his life mission, for he didn't need a retreat to go to, to go sort of find himself and figure out what should I do with my life. He didn't need a business plan or read a book from some top 100 seller to help him understand what should be my goal in life, for his life was mapped out before him. One day, he was traveling to Syria, and he heard a voice. And as he's headed to Syria, he has papers in his hand. And those papers not only gave him the ability to sequester Christians, but those papers were actually death certificates. Because with those papers, he had the authority to see capital punishment acted out in the life of these Christians as they spread this message about a people and a person called the way, the truth, and the life. And as he's headed to Syria one day, he hears that voice, and a voice says to him, why are you persecuting me? His fellow travelers, they heard the voice too, but they didn't see anything, but, but he saw one, and in a moment, he was struck blind, and he could not physically see. Well, a few days went by, and a man was tapped on the shoulder to go and lay his hands on him to give him his sight back. And after a little bit of persuasion, Ananias goes to Saul of Tarsus, and he says these words, Acts 9, 17. The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And with those simple words, Saul of Tarsus regained his sight. A few days goes by, and his life is completely changed. To say it was a 180 would sort of be a conservative measure, because this man, Saul of Tarsus, was hell-bent on going to Damascus to carry off Christians And he goes there to persecute them. And by the time he gets there, dear friends, he is one. (laughs) And when he understands who this is talking to him and his life is completely changed, 
Luke says this of him in Acts 9.20, immediately, three days later after he was blinded, immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying this, he is the Son of God. And friends, for the next 32 to 33 years, the Apostle Paul will go with one mission in life, one aim in life, one message in life that got him out of bed every single morning and gave him great passion to live with purpose. And that message he carried was the gospel. It was the message of Jesus. It was the word and the works of Jesus. Now, last week, we began a series called The Gospel More Than You Hope through the book of, or through the chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, the first 11 verses, and what we discovered is in Acts chapter 18, the Apostle Paul is on his uh, second missionary journey, and he goes to Corinth. He befriends some of the local people there in Corinth. He shares the message of the gospel, and God saves some of them, and a church is born. We call it the church at Corinth. And after some letter passing, he writes what we have here, the letter 1 Corinthians. Now, he wrote 1 Corinthians because after this church is planted, uh, four years later, Paul is now in Ephesus. His running buddy, his, his uh, for lack of a better term, homie in the gospel, his running buddy, brought him an oral report. There's trouble in Corinth, Paul. The church you left that was healthy, it's not the same church. The church, to put it bluntly, has gone to pot. The church is a mess. The church has left the rails of the gospel. The church is in trouble, Paul. So Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, picks up his pen and he writes this letter of correction to help them understand. You're over here, you need to be over there. You're over there, you need to be over here. You need to start this and you need to stop that. You need to stop this and you need to start that. And so this letter of correction we surveyed last week as to why they needed to be corrected. And the great thing here at PVC is all of our services are recorded. So if you missed last week, I encourage you, go watch that because you really want to see how we got where we're at. Why is the church in Corinth such a mess? And what in the world happened for them to get so far off the rails of the gospel? Very simple. They forgot the gospel. They had forgotten the, the same gospel that saved them is the same gospel that will save them from the effects of the world coming into the life of the church. And, and here's the reality about any church. If, if you and I ever allow this gospel to get out of the center of all that we say and all that we do, then this church will crumble. This church could be liberal one day. Do you know that? This church could be a liberal church theologically one day, and it will be, it will be, and it can be if we do not guard the fact that the gospel must remain at the center of all that we do. God's gospel, I pray, would become so embedded in my heart and so embedded in your heart, dear friends, that we would never lose sight of its preciousness. And friends, that the gospel would sort of be like a fence built around this flock, protecting us from allowing the world to come in and crumble the thing that God is building in this place. Now, last week, we looked at gospel importance, and we outlined the importance of the gospel. This week, we're going to look at gospel theology. And what we want to do is we want to look at and allow Paul's exposition of the gospel. We want to look at it, the gospel from God's point of view and learn how to better apply its truth to our reality so that we would learn to rest in God's love for us so that we would live for God as a response to God's love for us in Jesus. So, notice verse 1. Now, I would remind you, he, he needs to remind them because they have forgotten it. I want to remind you, Corinthians, when I was with you for 18 months, Corinthians, I, I labored this gospel to you. We talked about this. We labored on the words and works of Jesus, and you have forgotten it. You, if you go back and watch last week, the reason this church left the reservation 
and they were no longer on the rails they needed to be is because they forgot the gospel. So he writes, I want to remind you, brothers, of the gospel. And I, being Paul, preached. I I communicated this to you, and you understood it. Now, many of these Corinthians grew up pagans, all right? They grew up worshiping the love goddess Aphrodite. And I I got a picture here for you of the temple they most likely probably went to. Something along these lines here on the screen is this picture of the temple that they would go into and they would worship Aphrodite. It was this statue of this woman that they would go and, and... all kinds of erotic practices would take place inside this temple. And, and if you were a little boy or a little girl growing up in Corinth, mom and dad went here all the time. Grandma and grandpa went here all the time. Aunt and uncle went here all the time. And if you grew up and kept instead, you would go here too. And you would go and pay your homage to Aphrodite. And these were pagans in Corinth. This is what they knew. This is what they understood to be the God that made them, the God that sustained them, the God that controlled the Mediterranean Sea around them, and they went and gave their lives to this Aphrodition uh, erotic goddess that they, they all went to. And the thing about this particular congregation is some of them were probably all had also had a Jewish background. This was a conglomeration of both Gentile Christians and Jewish Christians. So, uh, many of them, uh, maybe they grew up, mommy, mom and dad, teaching them the tenets of the Torah, the Old Testament, but they had walked away from that and they had brought, in, brought into this. So whatever their background is, they were pagan worshipers. Well, when Paul brought the message of the gospel to Corinth, God awakened some, opened dead ears and dead eyes to see that They need to repent of that, and they need to believe that Jesus is not just their Savior, but He's King. Caesar is not King. The president, so to speak, is not King. Jesus is King. And so they submitted to Him as King. And friend, that's your story, is it not? At some point in your life, you heard the message of the gospel. You may have heard it many times before you actually believed it. But at some point, God opened your ears to hear, eyes to see, just like he knocked Paul off of his high horse, he knocked you off your high horse. Maybe it was a religious high horse, maybe it was a a worldly high horse, but either way, you were on a crash course for the wrath of God, and God rescued you by opening your eyes to see the beauty of who Jesus is. And Paul says, Corinthians, I want you, I want to remind you of this. This is where you came from. This is where you came from. And, and for me, that happened when I was 10. I, I, I was raised in a very Christian household, thank God for my parents. But the reality is, my hope was in what I did or my parents did or my religious upbringing. I was a, a church rat, if you will, when the doors were open, I was there. And I was trusting in that. I didn't realize that, but a man shared with me, you don't just need to know about Jesus, but do you actually know Jesus? Well, I didn't, and he helped me understand how. I repented, I believed the gospel, and I received. And I walked away from looking to my churchiness And from that point on, I was no longer um, trusting in what I did, but trusting in Christ alone. My question is to you, is have you had that moment in your life? Have you? Have you had that moment where you looked away from your church attendance or maybe your paganism or maybe whatever it was and said, I cannot look to those things to make me right with God because it's never enough. Because God demands perfection. And Jesus came and lived a life we could not live, a perfect life. He died the death we should have died in the place of sinners. And this is Paul telling them, you you receive this message. Look, Look what he says in the next part, which you received and which you stand. The idea of received is it made a home in you. Has the gospel made a home in you? Has it made a home in you? Where you're you're resting in what Christ has done? The, the gospel had made a home in this Corinthian congregation. There used to be a bunch of pagans who went down to the Aphrodite goddess and paid homage to her. And now they're a congregation of people whom the Holy Spirit is dwelling among them. Has the gospel made a home in you? Notice he says, too, and by which you are being saved. Now, we talked about this last week. Salvation has three parts. Justification, glorification, uh, and in the middle is sanctification. 
When, when you looked away from yourself and you put your faith in Christ alone, in that moment, you were justified. God declared you no longer liable for the sins that you brought to you that your parents passed down from you. Just remember this, parents, when your children don't act the way that you want them to, remember you and I are responsible for passing the sin nature onto them, right? If it weren't for you birthing them, then they wouldn't have the sin nature that they have. So therefore, we must give much grace. But when you are saved, you are justified. That means right now, if you're not saved, you are guilty before God. You are guilty. You are guilty of sin. And when you turn away from looking to anything but Christ and save, you're not only deemed not guilty, God doesn't hold you liable for your sins, but friends, He also makes you righteous. Well, you're now, in God's eyes, you are a perfect law keeper because everything that was perfect about Christ has been applied to you. And, and then at the end, one day we'll be glorified. That's when, when either Jesus comes or we die as believers and we go be with him. And sin will not even be around anymore. We won't even have the propensity to sin anymore. We'll have new glorified bodies. Sin won't be around. We will be glorified. In the middle of being justified and glorified is we're being sanctified. You and I right now as Christians, if you're a Christian, would you say Amen. So those of us who are believers, friends, we're being sanctified. We're learning, are we not, how to walk better in love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. The fruit of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is ripening all those virtues upon the limbs of our lives. And some of us are not where we need to be. Amen? And some of us, praise God, are not where we were. And you need to know this, friend. You may Today you may think, Jordan, I thought I'd be so much further along my Christian journey than I am. Be encouraged. His Spirit lives in you. He's not done with you. He's producing things in you that you cannot produce in yourself. Friend, we've got to learn how to die to our agenda so He can live through us and shine through us. Another way to think about these different modes of salvation is I was saved, I'm being saved, and one day I will be saved. I was saved, justified, I'm being saved, sanctified, and one day I will be saved, glorified. What Paul says is the same gospel, Corinthians, that justified you and one day will glorify you, that same gospel, you're being saved. See what he says right there? You're being saved. Remember last week, how can you be saved and be being saved? Very simply, there's different modes of salvation. You were saved, not guilty. Now you're being saved from this world, being saved from your own sin nature, being saved from the grip of the devil, all those things. But when the Bible talks about glorification, here's the really cool thing. The Bible talks about glorification. It talks about like it's already done. Watch this, dear friend, Christian friend. You right now in God's have, you've already been glorified. So it, 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 it's as good as done. It's as good as done that right now you already have been glorified. But the reason that church is so messy, and it is, and the reason that this church at Corinth was so messy is because they forgot the gospel, but they forgot that that gospel was supposed to, you're going deeper in the gospel. You're, you're being saved. You say, Jordan, how do I apply that idea? It's, it's, it's very simply this. It's constantly marveling at the cross. The fact that God would save you via the cross. That God demonstrated his love like, like Doug prayed. And it's constantly being overwhelmed by God's love for me that I want to love him back by living for him. That's what it means to be being saved. The gospel is going deeper in you then. See, a lot of people grow up and think the gospel, oh, that's something you do when you first get saved. No, no, the gospel is both for the believer, but it's also for the unbeliever. The gospel is for the unbeliever in this sense. You right now need to be saved. The gospel is the good news you can be saved. The gospel for the believer is this. I keep marveling at the fact that God would save me which then motivates me to want to live for him. After all, look at how he loved me. He died for me. See, now the gospel is getting deeper. So that's going to make you the husband God wants you to be because your spouse is not going to react many times the way you wish they would. Amen? And you know what? There are many times God wants you to do things and you're not reacting the way he wants you to. But does his love change for you? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And so this makes you a better husband, right? 
Because when your wife doesn't respond the way you think that she should, you say, oh God, that's what I do to you all the time. And you're so gracious to me. So help me be gracious to my precious bride for, wow, I've been loved so good. Whether you're single, whether you're married, whether you're divorced, whether you're everywhere in between, the gospel applies to you as a believer because you're constantly going deeper in how God has loved you, which makes you love him back and love other people the same way. So you're being saved. And notice he qualifies it, though. He says, if, big if, 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 if you hold fast. It's a big if. If you hold fast, the word, that would be the word of the gospel, I preach to you unless you believed in vain. Now, friends, this passage does not teach that you may be in in danger of losing your salvation, for the Bible makes it very clear that if you've been born again, you can't be unborn again, right? So, if you've been born again, you never can be unborn. Now, you could have never been born, but if you've been born, you can't be unborn. So, this, this passage is very clearly not teaching that, but what it is teaching is that these Corinthians have failed to believe the whole gospel, the whole gospel. The whole gospel would be, I believe that I'm justified before God, I'm not guilty, and that I've been made righteous. That would be a, a, a mode of salvation. The second one is believing that I'm being saved currently as I marvel at my justification. And then I, I, I'm amazed that one day I'll be glorified, and it's as if it is already done. That's the whole gospel. And what they have done is they have failed to believe the whole thing. You must hold fast. You must hold fast. This is what we said last week. You never look at your sanctification to prove your justification. That would be crazy. Because what if you look at, and on a bad day, if you say, well, am I saved? Look at my lifestyle. You never look at your fruit as much as you look at is the root of your understanding Christ. Christ. Is Christ. Is, is He the reason by which I am doing all that I do because I was saved, I'm being saved, and one day I will be saved. Now you say, Jordan, we get that. Move on. I don't think you do. We have to constantly preach this gospel to ourselves. As a dad, I've got to preach to myself all the time. As a, as a husband, as a pastor, as just a person driving in traffic, I've got to preach the gospel to myself to realize that I'm, I get from God all the time what I don't deserve. So I've got to constantly give to everybody else what they don't deserve. God loved me so I can love other people more than they'll ever love me. should be our mode in life. I want to love pe- people more than they could ever possibly love me. Why? Because I've been loved so well by God in Christ and the gospel. I'm being saved, see? I'm being saved from the grip of my old ways. So friends, let's ask God for grace to hold fast. Hold fast means to like, you know, choke it out. All right, hold on to this gospel. Hold on to the whole gospel. That I'm, I'm saved, I'm being saved, and I will be saved. This is why Paul says in verse 3, the gospel is of first importance, and it's in a category all by itself. It is of first importance that you understand the whole gospel, that you take hold of it and don't let go. You know, in the early 60s, some of you might remember the Green Bay Packers lost a miserable defeat. And the next year, they show up to training camp, 38 players, they show up, and and they think that they're just going to pick up where they left off the year before. They had a pretty deep run, almost all the way to the the Super Bowl, got beat, and they come back to training camp, and they think, well, we're just going to pick up where we left off. Well, Vince Lombardi, the legendary coach, uh, walks into the room and looks at 38 grown men, professional football players, and he says five of the most memorable words in NFL history. He takes a football, he holds it out before him, and he says, gentlemen, this is a football. And for the next six months, and for that whole training camp, they blocked and tackled until they were weary. They went back to the basics. They made sure they understood that. Six months later, they beat the New York Giants 37 to nothing in a landslide. I mean, the Giants shouldn't even got off the bus. They got destroyed. And friends, this is the gospel. This is the gospel. This is as basic as it gets, but it's also as deep as it ever gets. Because again, when you get saved, it's not, you don't need, it's not like, oh yeah, I got the gospel. A lot of people think the gospel is like, like the gospel's like the diving board and they jump off in the pool and live the Christian life out there. It's not true. The gospel is actually the pool you jump into. 
And your life is now just learning to swim in that gospel. Just learning to marvel at what God has done in Christ for you as he sanctifies you. That is the motivation. The gospel is the motivation to live the Christian life. This gospel is more important than anything else. It's more important than our economy. It's more important than our health care. It's more important than our marriages. It's more important than our grandchildren. It's more important than our great-grandchildren. It's more important than who's in the White House or who we wish were in the White House. It's more important than who's impeached, who was elected, who wasn't elected. It's more important than Alzheimer's. It's more important than cancer. It's more important than health care. It's more important than healthy eating. It's more important than your personal fitness. It's more important than your beautiful baby. It's more important than your troubled teenager. This gospel is more important than anything else you have in your life. Anything else. And Paul would die a martyr's death, by the way, 33 years later after preaching this gospel. So the very foundation of our lives, the very foundation of what we do must be based on this gospel. So let me ask you this question. Are you living a gospel-centered life? Are you living a gospel-centered life? What that means is you're constantly marveling at the gospel which motivates you to live for this God who saved you. That's a gospel-driven life, a gospel-centered life. So what is the gospel? What is the gospel? All this gospel, gospel, gospel talk, what is the gospel? Well, it's one Greek word. Put it up here on the screen for you. It is euangelion, euangelion. So when someone says, what is the gospel? It's one word in Greek, euangelion. You, 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 the prefix you, you, you know, you've been to a funeral. You've heard a eulogy. That's a good word about someone, right? You've heard a euphonium. It's a good sounding instrument. You've heard a euphemism which is a good spin on words. You means good. You, that's the prefix, you. And then angelos, what does that sound like? Sounds like angel. So it literally means, the gospel means a good messenger. It doesn't just mean good message, it actually means good messenger. That the one who is communicating the message in that moment, they are a good messenger. Now this word was not a Christian word initially. It was baptized, if you will. It was Christianized. So before it was used in a Christian way, um, it was a term of victory. It's a term of victory. A, a, a people would be in war. They didn't have Twitter or Facebook or, you know, Fox News or CNN.com. They got their word from people telling them oral reports. So they would be in war, and if they won, a gentleman would ride back into town, and he would say, eulogy, good news, we won. And so when the New Testament writer said, what's a word that we can get that could be uh, pregnant with meaning, if you will? Has a lot of meaning to it, but captures the essence of it. And they come up, we're going to use the word euangelion. We're going we're to sort of hijack it from the world, and we're going to Christianize it. And so we're going to say, good news. So what is the gospel, simply put? If you, if you had to bullet it down and someone said, what is the gospel? If you didn't see last week, I went out and interviewed people in our community last week. Had all these interviews, and I just asked them a simple question, what is the gospel? You heard confusion and you heard clarity. Here, here's, I, I believe, the most clear answer as to what the gospel is. Here it is. The gospel is the words and works of Jesus. That is the gospel. The gospel is the words and works of Jesus. That is what the gospel is, the words and works of of Jesus. Now, in Acts 20 and verse 29, in a very tearful scene, Paul is pleading with the Ephesian elders to be on guard for those who will come in and try to, like savage wolves, mess up the flock that God has put them over. And this is what he says. Paul says, and this is a very, again, very emotional, tearful scene. They may never see Paul again as he's getting on this boat. And Paul says this to the Ephesian elders, I know that after my departure, Fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own cells will arise men, speaking twisted things, to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert. Now, I extrapolate from this that there will always be people who want to get God's people off the rails. Sometimes they're within a flock. Sometimes people... Inside a flock, want to get the flock off of 
the focus of the truth of the message of the gospel, I would say here. And then there's, there's always going to be opposition from the world outside of us, right? Um, but what we see from the book of Acts, if the world can't get in, then, it, then Satan will actually use people in the church itself to get things stirred up and get people off the rails of the gospel, which is why you need to pray for myself and our elders that our chief goal is to guard this flock from fierce wolves and in, within, without, that want to come and get us off the rails of the gospel. Now, I like history. We learn from it. If you look at any institution, any institution, they normally do not drift toward conservative. They normally always drift to liberal. If you look at the church, which is an institution, if you look at colleges, seminaries, denominations, parachurch ministries, they never drift conservative. They always drift liberal. And there's really never a way to correct that, save Reformation. And if you know anything about Reformation, when, the thing, when you burn the thing to the ground, whatever the thing is, there's a lot of bodies left around. It's ugly. It's nasty. And friends, I pray that we would do such a good job, by God's grace, of guarding the gospel in this place and the truth of God in this place that we'd never have to have a reformation in the life of this church. Many churches need a reformation today. Some denominations need a reformation. Some parachurch ministries need a reformation. It's always ugly. And friends, if we will give ourselves to make sure the gospel stays at everything, at the center of what we do, God will guard us from that. I love what Pastor Joe Thorne says up at Redeemer in St. Charles. He says this. He says, when pastors get bored with the gospel, they gravitate to social issues, politics, or pragmatics as a matter of first importance. Now, there are some things we need to give our ears to and give our attention to, but as a first importance, the gospel must remain. I pray that you'll never get bored with the gospel. I pray you never get bored with it. I pray I never get bored with it. I pray that we'll just keep going deeper in it. So where'd the gospel come from? Well, notice the next part of the passage. He says, I delivered to you as a first importance what I also received. You see what Paul is saying? I didn't make this up. God gave it to me. He revealed it to me. I didn't make this gospel up. God revealed it to me. Remember we talked about that? He got knocked off his horse. That's Acts chapter 9. He'll tell that story three or four times throughout the book of Acts. This is what he's saying. It was delivered to me. I was riding on my horse just going to kill Christians, and it was delivered to me. It was made known. I'm on the wrong path. I'm on the wrong path. So he said, it was given to me, and I'm just giving it to you. I'm passing it down. It's passing through my hands. And what, what was that? Notice that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. This means that Jesus is our substitute. He died in our place. He died in our place on our behalf instead of us. He died in our place on our behalf instead of us. 700 years before Jesus comes on the scene, the book of Isaiah, Isaiah says, He was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities, and our peace was upon Him, Jesus, and by His stripes were healed. This means, again, that when Jesus died on the cross, He died in our place, on our behalf, instead of us. But before he died to sinner's death, he lived a life of perfect devotion to the Father. And friends, Jesus prayed a lot of prayers in his life, but he never prayed a prayer of confession because he never sinned. The reason that Jesus could die in the place of sinners is because he himself was not a sinner. He was the sinless one, dying for the sinners, you and I. And by his stripes, by believing in, in what he did for us, we've been eternally Healed. Now, we'll talk about that passage one day because a lot of people take the whole healing passage and do something the Bible never does with it. But for these purposes, we have been eternally, spiritually healed. And once you become a Christian, remember, not only are we not guilty, but now we have been given the perfect righteousness of Christ. Theologians call this the sweet exchange. That everything bad about me was put on Jesus, and everything perfect about him has now been given to me. That I'm going to heaven on credit, if you will. I've been credited with the perfect righteousness of Christ. It's not on debit because I, I, I can't pay for it. It's already been paid for. I've been credited with the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. Now stay with me, church, because he goes on here and he says that he was buried. 
Now, the burial is important, okay? It's important that Jesus was buried. You know why? Because it shows he was actually dead. He wasn't a spirit being. He was a true man. He wasn't swooning. He wasn't sort of unconscious. He didn't sort of have a bad day and fall asleep and then just woke up. No, he was put in a sealed tomb as a dead man. All four Gospels mention that his brutalized body, his, his corpse was laid in a tomb. And all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, talk about Joseph of Arimathea, talk about the tomb, talk about the linen, talk about the spices of his body. Now, liberal scholars will attack the Gospels. Right around, right around Easter time, the History Channel goes nuts, does it not? And they show all of these stories about how the Gospels are con- convoluted and they're not right and Matthew says this and Mark says this and Luke says that and we can't trust the Gospels so we need the Gospel of Thomas and we need the Gospel of this and all these other Gospels. When if they would just be logical and realize that Matthew was writing for one reason, Mark was writing for another reason, Luke was writing for another reason, John was writing for another reason, different kind of language, different crowd, different emphasis, same story, same message, four different postures. So he died, he was buried. Then notice, he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scripture. Now, resurrection is arguably the most important part. For if he is not raised, there is no gospel story. And Paul will later say in this chapter, our faith is in vain. We're a bunch of ignorant people. If he wasn't raised, we're doing all this in vain. If Jesus wasn't raised, why are we here? If Jesus wasn't raised, why do we have any of this? But because he is raised, according to the scripture, So think about this. On Friday, the check was written. Jesus paid for sins. The check was written. On Sunday, when he rose again, the check cleared. The check cleared. And really, the resurrection is a receipt, if you will. That payment was taken on Friday. So when Jesus got up from the grave, the check cleared. And now anyone anywhere who repents and believes in Christ, he will not turn them away. He will not turn you away. So he died, he was buried, and notice he says it's, it's according to the scripture. Notice five, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. Now that's something, friends. If, if, one, if 500 people saw Jesus at one time, that's a pretty good evidence that he really was alive. We've had, we've had 500 people that saw Jesus Say at the park over here, across the street, 500 people saw Jesus. That would be pretty good evidence that this really happened. And so, you see what Paul's doing here? He's building this case that the Scripture beforehand said he would do it. We see all that. And now the backside is there were eyewitnesses to actually see that what the Bible says would happen actually did happen. And so, we tie all this back to the fact that It's according to the Scripture. Now, John Stott said this. This is a $5,000 quote. $5,000 quote. Notice this quote. If he had not been man, he could not redeem man. If he had not been a righteous man, he could not redeem unrighteous men. And if he had not been God's son, he could not redeem men for God or made them sons of God. Let's read that again. If he had not been man, he could not redeem man. If he had not been a righteous man, he could not redeem unrighteous men. And if he had not been God's son, he could not redeem men for God or made them sons of God. Now again, friends, that is a $5,000 quote. Four Four verbs. He died, he was buried, he was raised, he appeared. Now this is important. He died, that confirms Jesus is truly human. He's buried, that confirms he was truly dead. He's raised, that confirms he's really God, and he appeared. He confirmed that this really happened. Friends, this is the sum and substance of the gospel. So how do we respond? How do we respond to such news like this? Well, Jesus said, John 6, 40, he said, For this is the will of my Father." that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life. God's will for everyone here or online is to hear the message of the gospel, the words and the works of Jesus, and believe. In John, 1 John 5, 13, John says this, I write these things to you who believe in the name 
of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Friend, I want you to draw a circle around yourself. Not your spouse, she's not included in this, he's not, around yourself. Do you know that you know that you really, really know that you are resting in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation? Is it Jesus plus anything else? Is it Jesus plus my baptism? That's not the gospel. Is it Jesus plus my church attendance? That is not the gospel. Is it Jesus plus my dad was a deacon growing up? That is not the gospel. Is it Jesus plus I'm a pastor? Jesus plus anything will always equal nothing before God. But Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Today, if you draw that line around your circle and, and you ask the question, am I relying on anything else right now other than Jesus to give me peace and acceptance with God? After the service today, I'm going to be right here. Doug's going to be right here. Others will be here. Let's have coffee this week and talk about it. Let's have a conversation today and talk about it. Because I would suspect it's going to take more than just a moment. It's going to take a lot of talking and working through it. And Biblical Christianity is the only religion where God becomes a man and loves you by dying in your place on your behalf instead of you. That's the only religion that it's like that. So do you know him? And then the application for the Christian. This week, I, I really implore us to think about as we live the Christian life that we do it as a response to the gospel. Because that is being saved. That is being sanctified. That is being made more like Christ. The other, the other way is this. I'm going to live for Jesus because I don't want to have a flat tire on the way to work. Or I'm going to live for Jesus so that my kids will have a good day at school. Those are two bad reasons to live for Jesus. Bad reasons. The greatest reason is that I'm going to live for Jesus because he loved me and I want to love him back. Whether my kids have a great day or all four tires go flat, I want to love him. May that be our motivation. Lord, thank you so much for this truth. Thank you that we do believe in these things and we recognize that belief is a gift from you. So I pray, dear Father, that you would bless those online, those here that have never believed the gospel or are having trouble believing the gospel, even as Christians like these Corinthians. Lord, help us as a body to always love your gospel, to grow in an understanding of how precious it is for all of life to the glory of your beautiful name. We pray it in Jesus' name. As we stand, let's sing these truths.
believe in the resurrection that we will rise again for i believe in the name of jesus i believe in you i believe you rose again again church I believe I believe in you I believe you rose again I believe that Jesus I believe in life eternal. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus, for I believe in the name of Jesus, for I believe in the name of Jesus. One of those last slides talked about uh, what is your next step. And what a great reminder today that for all of us, there is a next step, right? Perhaps you're here and as Jordan said, you've never heard the good news of Jesus and you want to talk about that, come see us. Uh, we'd love to talk to you about that. But for those of us that have made that decision, there is a next step, and that is abiding in Christ, being filled with his spirit, uh, bearing much fruit. So uh, let's pray, and we will be dismissed. Father, thank you for this day, and thank you for your word. Thank you uh, for this treasure that you've given us. And Father, thank you for this passage and this te text that we uh, looked at today. Father, thank you for the gospel, and help us to hold fast to the gospel of first importance. Father, help us, each one of us, to uh, never uh, drift away from the gospel, to keep it at the center of our lives, and to constantly uh, marvel in what you have done for us and, and our love for you. Grow in that for us to be filled with your spirit that would um, result in us bearing fruit, much fruit. Father, I thank you for... Uh, your word. And for those, if there are any here today that have never uh, given their heart to Jesus, never accept him as their savior, Father, I just pray that today um, this message, your word, would touch their hearts, and Father, that they would, um, their curiosity would lead them to pursuing more knowledge about you, and Father, that they would come to a saving knowledge of you. Father, thank you once again for this, just allowing us to gather together and, and praise your name and worship you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.